Uh, Hemendra Hazari as well as Lancelot Dikuna now join us this morning. Good morning, gentlemen. Uh, Hemendra, let me come to you. Uh, for the last three, four quarters, you have been talking about private banks, especially on the corporate side, that, you know, there may be some issues on the asset quality, which, uh, which you know, can pop up in a quarter. Uh, you think ICICI, uh, the worst is behind or it's probably just the start? Firstly, it's not maybe. There are major, major issues for the corporate portfolio of all these banks. And for ICICI and for the entire banking industry, what you're currently seeing in ICICI Bank, which the market supposedly is so concerned about, is just the beginning of a huge tsunami, which is going to hit all these banks because the corporate sector is under severe stress. And, you know, there are a lot of assets uh, which uh, other banks and especially government banks have classified as NPAs or restructured. And I still find it that, uh, you know, some of these new private sector banks, they're continuing to keep it standard. So, I, you know, in contrast to the market, it is my opinion that the transparency on poor asset quality is far superior in the PSU banks than it is in with the private sector banks. Right. But, you know, yesterday we saw syndicate bank numbers. They were complete whitewash. You think the possibility that they may get worse from here on is also there for, for the PSU banking space as well? Oh, most definitely. For, at least for the PSU banks, you know, I think syndicate bank uh, is going to lead the charge for banks reporting losses. And these losses, you will find, are going to start accumulating. I'm expecting about four to five additional government banks to report losses. And this will continue to the fourth quarter, uh, you know, for a minimum. So this tells you really what is the true asset quality. And it is finally emerging after many, many quarters. And this is also the fate that is going to befall the new private sector banks. I think I, what you're seeing in ICICI Bank, which the market has suddenly woken up, is just the tip of an iceberg. There's some huge corporate assets, especially on the foreign books, uh, which are continuing to be reported as standard, uh, that they're continuing to be reported as not restructured. So all these assets will have to surface. And that's what we are seeing now. <laughs> Right. Uh, do you expect, uh, you know, something like an Axis Bank uh, to now also not go up? Uh, I mean, the results came out. We spoke after the results. They very clearly said that, you know, 1.6% uh, is the cross NPA and they have provided majority of the issues that RBI had raised. You think that's a better place? How would one look at it? Would the valuations there be superior to ICICI Bank then or uh, people would wait for the next quarter? I think that 1.6%, in my opinion, is a gross underestimation. You should expect Axis Bank, Yes Bank also to have these kind of problems. Now, whether they report, they report, you know, sharp deterioration uh, remains to be seen. But the corporate book of some of these new private sector banks is very similar to the government banks. And I think Syndicate Bank has already indicated, uh, now what is the impact on its profits? So you're going to see, and this is just the beginning of a few tidal waves which are going to hit the banking sector. Right. Uh, Lancelot, uh, your word on the ICICI Bank numbers, the commentary over there, uh, still the worst is yet to come? Well, I think, yes, the commentary did indicate that, you know, there could be uh, more stress in the system and, you know, it's it's not the beginning of a turnaround for uh, for uh, ICICI Bank in terms of uh, NPAs. <clears throat> so that's something which we can, uh, you know, we can expect for the next quarter. And uh, going forward, I think it's important to see how the bank is able to improve its uh, capital adequacy in terms of being able to meet its uh, requirements because that will be key for to whether it can you know expand its retail book because that's i think where the focus is going to be with almost all the banks given that corporate demand is extremely low and you aren't seeing much of traction on that front right uh, what do you make of maruti numbers uh, poor set of <coughs> numbers or uh, maybe after six quarters you would uh, you know wait for the trend uh, before taking a decision well, I think uh, Maruti's numbers were, you know, in line with what was expected because we obviously didn't expect a huge uh, uh, growth. In terms of profitability, you did see some amount of pressure on, on profits going forward because in this quarter and we expect some pressure to continue going forward because of various expenditure increases on new launches and, uh, and the related advertising as well as the discounts given to dealers. So that pressure will continue. But uh, if you look at it from a broader perspective, it's, you know, it's one of the better performing companies where the valuations really had gone extremely aggressive. I think now that the valuations are coming off, you know, it may become attractive if, uh, if it falls a little further for investors to start looking at the stock because it controls a fairly large proportion of the passenger car market, has got models in every segment. So there are a lot of positives in terms of Maruti being able to uh, you know, continue to grow.
Right. Uh, Maruti, you know, how would you take uh, the yen picture now? Because till yesterday, yen was around 118 and there were concerns it may not go back to 120. But with BOJ easing now, it, it has gone back to 121. Uh, you think it's still early to take that call or uh, you know, it should probably in the near term react to numbers rather than the yen movement? Well, I think it's, uh, you know, very difficult to, uh, to predict uh, currency movements and, and trying to then factor those currency movements into valuations of stock and, and then trying to predict what could be the valuation, I think is an even more difficult exercise. So one should probably stay away from uh, trying to predict currency movements and see the impact. Unless it's of a permanent nature, you know, and where you believe that, okay, this is now a permanent either appreciation or depreciation. So for a fairly long period of time, if it's going to remain stable, then you factor those changes in the currency into your uh, earnings models. So I think at this point of time, it's better to stick to the earnings and then, you know, look at uh, how the currency is moving in terms of, uh, you know, whether this is more of a permanent nature or is it just going to be a temporary period while you see a move, up move, and then thereafter again stabilize back lower. Right. Uh, Himendra, what do you make of the other banking uh, sector stocks? I mean, some of the names like Axis are going down, Yes is going down, uh, PSU banks are going down. Uh, you think all of them uh, will be under pressure? Because ICICI is a big pie, and if something like ICICI bank is not doing well, it's very difficult for some of these other banks. Uh, you, I think, briefly mentioned about it, but do you think that's the correct way? Almost definitely. I think for some time now, you know, the market has believed that the new private sector banks are a special breed and they are immune to the economic slowdown which was impacting the government banks. I think now, you know, wisdom is dawning rather late on the market after ICICI Bank's results that even Yes Bank, Axis Bank may have similar problems. And to me, this is very long overdue. And this is, as I said, just the tip of the iceberg, what you're seeing in ICICI Bank and the market, you know, is getting so concerned that it has, you know, ICICI Bank is down 5%. And there are so many more assets and very large corporate assets which are just residing very innocuous, innocuously on these balance sheets, uh, which have just been evergreen all the time. So there are major, major issues in the banking industry and the new private sector banks cannot be immune from all these things. Right. Uh, you know, uh, what would you make of the management commentary of ICICI Bank? Uh, they said particularly that, you know, there is a steel sector exposure that they have. Uh, not taking names or trying to predict what's happening in. Uh, but do you think more of the steel sector would come in? We look at Axis Bank in terms of post commentary. There was a pharma company, there was a battery company, one power company. Uh, so, you know, it's, it's like all the sectors are not doing well, but uh, Axis did not take a name of steel. ICICI is telling steel is not doing well. How would you take that commentary? So let me tell you, steel is just in the, one of the most difficult sectors currently. But having said that, all the sectors have been very badly impacted. Today, there are very few quality corporate borrowers who are paying interest on the due date. So this cancer has spread to the entire system. And the steel, the way steel is performing, it is going to be a total whitewash. So it is not just steel. You know, there are a lot of other natural resource companies. Like you have a GVK Coal. Uh, you know, which the banking sector has uh, considerable exposure to, which is based in Singapore. And some of the PSU banks have already identified it and provided for it as NPA. You have Aban Offshore. You know, all these accounts are there. You know, I'm, I'm sad to say I don't think a lot of these accounts where the new private sector banks have even rest called it restructured or even NPA. Right. Uh, and you think that uh, sooner or later, uh, all of this would get, have to get aligned, which means that there, there could be more cleanup in the coming quarters? There's going to be a very major cleanup. You know, the RBI is talking of cleaning up the, of the accounts uh, till March 2017. I think by March 2017, you may even see the cleaning up of the entire banks. Right. Uh, Lancelot, let me come to you. What do you make of, uh, you know, Bharti's numbers? They were very bad. I mean, it was a clear miss. Uh, but uh, at least after idea, there was a slight bit of expectation on the street that they may be much worse than what is expected. Well, it's difficult to judge what was the expectation, but um, I think Bharti's numbers were, you know, expected in a sense that nobody, no analyst expected that, you know, the ARPUs would keep increasing. We did see a decline in uh, ARPUs, which was an expected uh, thing. What we are seeing is that there is a shift towards data, and obviously the large capex which uh, uh, they had to outlay, and the, uh, you know, acquisition of further spectrum. I think these are going to be huge capital additions which will have an impact on the return on capital going forward. So it's in a period where there is a large outlay that it will take uh, maybe a year or two before you start seeing uh, you know, a huge surge in data and 4G starts to begin to pay back on the investment. So in this period probably Bharti is you know, looking at 
uh, it could move a little lower as far as the stock is concerned but one can look at uh, staying away from investing into this sector till such time we start beginning to see some return on capital right uh, emender what would be your view on uh, maruti uh, did you have a look at the numbers a 15 to 20% plus miss on the uh, pat front for a company that is very well overowned may not be taken well see we are a company which is overowned you know any slight miss is a very major negative and the four wheeler space lot of the brokerage houses had been extremely positive about because this was a space which where the volume still were you know growing handsomely in contrast to the two wheeler space now with maruti's results you know there's going to be a you know major reassessment of how this sector is going to perform in future as well because as i said so far you've seen the four wheeler sector has been doing quite well it appears to have been quite insulated from the broad economic slowdown but as the slowdown worsens even sectors like automobiles and the retail sector is going to get impacted and especially if major stocks are overowned uh, you know there is going to be a big problem uh, for investors because the question then will will be where to hide you know today there are no safe havens it appears right uh, uh, lancelot what would you make of the bank of japan news that came in uh, you think bankers uh, would have to give additional qe and uh, that is something which is priced in into equities well i wouldn't say it's priced in but yes uh, you know with the easing up of uh, rates as far as the central bank is concerned i think it will become uh, you know a cue for others other bankers to to start looking at increasing liquidity as well as trying to keep uh, you know interest rates low in order to boost their economies so it becomes very difficult for uh, you know central banks to try and influence economic growth purely through monetary measures and and that uh, is where the problem lies so we aren't seeing you know the kind of translation of these monetary measures into economic growth immediately and even for example even in india um, with the interest rates coming off it was we haven't seen growth immediately getting you know uh, kicked off in that sense so i guess uh, restructuring of the economies and their and their entire uh, you know the pro- and addressing the problems that the economies are facing that becomes more an immediate priority and that will have to be done by policy makers uh, you know in the government space rather than purely relying on monetary policy to spur economies and turn around uh, growth right uh, emendra what would be your view uh, will uh, central banks around the world have to support growth via more easing So I think he has said a very relevant point about monetary policy stimulus, because it appears this, you know the governments only have this tool to revive the if you to revive the markets, and we have seen that you know you cannot keep doing it because you know if you just keep using monetary policy and a monetary stimulus, all it does is creates asset bubbles. Uh, strangely, you know the markets do not want to accept that you require fiscal stimulus to actually you know impact positively impact the real economy, but the markets perversely. they penalize any government which expands the fiscal deficit and in the absence of this both globally as well as in india at best you will get asset bubbles you will not see any real improvement in the economy uh, because the fiscal stimulus which in my opinion can really stimulate uh, economic growth as well as employment that the governments can are cannot use because the markets keep putting pressure on them that rising fiscal deficits are you know are a big negative because under the mistaken belief that a rising fiscal deficit uh, leads to inflation now you cannot have such a situation when there's huge under capacity utilization so therefore what you will find is at best they can do the uh, you know monetary stimulus which again will just lead to another asset bubble in those financial markets and what you require is a massive fiscal stimulus both for the global economies as well as for india